today on Let the Bible Speak. When the apostles went from Jerusalem preaching that Jesus is the Christ, what did that mean to those who heard it? And what should it mean to us today? We continue our series, Preaching Jesus, next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. Greetings, and thanks for joining me today for Let the Bible Speak. It's so good to have you here, and I'm privileged to have this time to study the Bible with you. We're in the midst of a series of lessons we call Preaching Jesus. In our last time together, we talked about preaching Jesus as the Son of God, how Jesus was called Emmanuel, God with us. And this speaks to His deity. He entered into time and space through the portal of woman and was God in the flesh, and why that is the crucial foundation of the Christian faith. But Jesus was also called the Jewish Messiah, the Christ. And this tells us even more about who Jesus was and is. When the evangelist Luke wrote to Theophilus his account of things, as he puts it in the King James translation, the things surely believed among us, he told of the birth of Jesus our Savior and of the words the angel declared to the shepherds who were watching their flocks that night. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. This son of Mary and foster son of Joseph was given the name Jesus, which is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua and means Savior. But here God gave him the title of the Christ. Christ is not His name so much, it is a description of who Jesus is. Were you to meet Jesus along some dusty road in Palestine or along the shores of Galilee in the first century, He might have introduced Himself to you as Jesus of Nazareth. But here God introduces Him to the shepherds and to all of the world as Jesus the Christ. And to those Jews who believed in Him in that day, He was Jesus the Christ. To His people today, He is the Christ. But just what does that mean? Preaching Jesus means preaching Him as the Christ, but what, what significance does that have? Well, we'll talk about that in our study today, preaching Jesus as the Christ. And I'll return with that in a moment. As God's Son, Jesus occupies the most unique and important office of any person in heaven or earth. As we've already illustrated in our current sermon series, many people don't understand the person and the work of Jesus. When the Bible calls Him the Son of God, it is telling us of His deity, His divine nature. He was not a man with God-like characteristics or powers. He was God in human flesh. He was the God-man. 
And by this means God manifested Himself unto mankind and provided something that could not be found on this earth, and that is a perfect and unblemished sacrifice to atone for and take away our sins. Now, if you don't believe that, then you haven't believed and obeyed the gospel. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 23, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. But the Bible also says that He is the Christ. And that term when spoken by a Jew in the first century had great meaning, and it should have great meaning to us as well. When Peter made his famous confession in the coast of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, verse 16, he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, to better understand the powerful implications of that statement, of that confession, we should begin by defining the word itself. The word Christ is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, and both words mean anointed. And therefore, when the Bible speaks of Jesus as the Messiah and Jesus as the Christ, it is simply calling Him Jesus the Anointed One. And that is packed with meaning when you understand some things about the Jews living under the Old Testament. When Jesus called Andrew to be His disciple, the Bible says that Andrew ran and found his brother Simon, and filled with excitement and breathless wonder, he declared to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Andrew happily believed that Jesus was finally at last the promised Anointed One of God. Later, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, she said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He, John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Well, both of these instances give us a glimpse into the expectation and the yearning that the Jews had down through the ages for the Messiah to come. Well, throughout the 1,500-year history of the nation of Israel, the people clung to that promise of a Messiah, one who would come and who would be anointed by God to rule over them. And the Old Testament is filled with Messianic prophecies. The Jews looked for the Messiah to come and be their ultimate king and ruler. Moses, for example, described him as a prophet like unto himself in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 8-9. through 9. The prophet Nathan later told David that the Messiah would one day rule over his kingdom and sit upon his throne forever in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12-17. through 17. Isaiah said that the government would rest upon his shoulders and that he would govern with justice and righteousness according to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Jeremiah pictures him as the righteous branch descended from David who would reign as king in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. And Micah declared that one born in Bethlehem would come forth to rule the nation, we're told in Micah, the fifth chapter, and the second verse. The Psalms are full of messianic predictions and foreshadowings picturing Messiah as one who would bring victory to God's people, triumph. And we're one, and we're one to closely follow the Old Testament writings. They would expect the Messiah to be born in a particular place at a particular time, and do and experience a number of things throughout his life on earth, and that finally he would die and rise again. So why then did the nation reject Jesus when he finally came, claiming to be their Messiah or their Christ, their anointed one of God? Why did they fail to see that he was this anointed one? Well, for one reason, an ignorance and or a misunderstanding of their own scriptures about the Messiah. You see, when these prophecies were given, a series of geopolitical events unfolded that ended up shaping the people's common image of what the Messiah would be when He came. The Jews, you may remember, were carried off into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, several hundred years before Jesus was born, and the nation was never the same after that. They spent hundreds of years being dominated by one world power after another until at last Rome took control and placed its heavy yoke of taxation and oppression upon the Jewish people. They had spent so long being occupied and subjugated by other empires until their expectation of Messiah shifted from that of a spiritual leader and king to an earthly one. So they were now looking for an impressive militant figure to arise and free them from the Romans and make them a sovereign nation once again. But this was never the mission of the Messiah. 
They eagerly anticipate a, anticipated a prophesied figure who would not only come from the lineage of David, but would be like David in restoring Israel and ruling the world. But Jesus came to deliver them from a much greater bondage than that of Rome or any other earthly, tyrannical power. He came to deliver them from the power of the devil and of sin, which ironically they did not see themselves in bondage to. You know, people are much the same way today. What Rome was to the Jews of Jesus' day, our earthly and temporal problems are to us today. And while the people were preoccupied with the political situation they were in and with their difficulties of life, well, they were woefully oblivious to the real issue that doomed them, and that was their sin and their broken relationship to God. Many today look to Jesus as a Messiah or a deliverer from their earthly trials and problems, whether it be health, finances, political oppression, economics, or social inequality. But Jesus came on a much greater and much more encompassing mission. And His office as the Messiah or the Christ does not speak to earthly things. It speaks to spiritual and heavenly matters, the things that truly matter. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went to the synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath and he read scripture to the people. And Luke tells us that he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So reads Luke chapter 4 verses 17 through 21. You see Jesus read these words from Isaiah chapter 61, which was a prophecy of the coming Messiah but their true meaning was lost upon those who heard him read those words that day. And in fact, they ultimately ended, throw, ended up throwing him out of the synagogue in their city. But note that Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Underscore that. We'll come back to that in a few moments. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me. He is saying, I am the Christ. Now the practice of anointing was a very important ritual in the religion of the Jews. Throughout the Old Testament dispensation, those who were set apart by God for positions of leadership were anointed with oil as a symbol of their authority. Oil was poured upon the head to indicate that God had chosen that person and set them apart for the work assigned to them. And there were three positions in particular for which a person was anointed in the Old Testament. They were those of prophets, priests, and kings. One who was a prophet of God was often anointed as such. This meant that the man had the authority given him by God to prophesy the word of the Lord to them. They were set apart as a prophet of God. They had God's sanction as a prophet. Because God had anointed them as a prophet, the people were to listen to him and accept his words as being the word of God. Well, there were many prophets in the nation of Israel, beginning with Moses himself who gave them the law to follow. But remember that Moses said in Deuteronomy the 18th chapter that God would raise up to them a prophet like him, and he says, Him shall you hear. But not only were prophets anointed, so were priests. Now priests served God in the temple in the Old Testament dispensation on behalf of the people. And in particular, a high priest was anointed to serve in this high office and to enter into the most holy place on behalf of the people to offer the blood of atonement to God who dwelt in that sacred chamber. And he did this once each year. Now nobody else had the right or the privilege to enter that place except the high priest. Spiritually speaking, it was the highest and grandest office of the Old Testament economy. And when a new high priest was selected, they were anointed as a way of setting them apart to intercede on behalf of the people before God. Well, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? And no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, verse 6. The Hebrew writer penned those beautiful words in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, saying, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's a wonderful assurance. Today, we have no earthly priest to stand between us and God, but we do have a heavenly high priest who having lived on earth as a man can represent us and intercede for us before God, and who as God represents God to us. Friend, there is no other way to enter the presence of holy God but by the work and mediatorship of Jesus Christ, our high priest. God anointed him to fill that role as the Christ. That's why no other religion will do. That's why Christ is the only way to God and to heaven. That's why we emphasize that. That's why the Word of God emphasizes that. That's why Christianity is so exclusive in saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven because He is our great high priest. To declare Him the Christ is to say that. He is God's anointed high priest, the one and only who can enter heaven and intercede and mediate between us and a holy God. And then in the Old Testament, they anointed kings. Their investiture was marked by anointing with oil, and they were shown to be selected by God to rule over the people. You recall when David refused to kill Saul, when he had the chance, he refused calling him God's anointed. In other words, even though Saul was a sinful man who was doing a great injustice to David, David recognized that Saul wore the crown of Israel, and he respected the authority that represented. He was God's anointed. God had placed him there. Now, God is not a cruel, or, or Jesus, rather, is not a cruel or unjust king. He is a king of righteousness and a king of peace, and Lord willing, we'll talk more about that in another lesson in our series. But David was later anointed by Samuel to be king after Saul, and David was a good king who ruled the nation well, and his reign marked the glory days of Israel. And even way back then, God promised that He would one day raise up another king to sit upon David's throne. That is, a king who would have David's kingdom conferred upon him. And in the fullness of time, when Jesus entered this earthly realm, God anointed Him before the people to be their king, which office He occupies today. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He rules and reigns as king right now at the right hand of God, just as He right now occupies the office of priest and he occupies the office of prophet. Now you may ask, when and how did God anoint Jesus? When did God set him apart as prophet, priest, and king? When was he officially set forth before the people as their Messiah, their Christ? Well, let's read together from the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. When the apostle Peter was sent to the house of the Gentile Cornelius to preach Christ to he and his household, he said these words beginning in verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears Him and works righteousness is, is accepted by Him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Notice he said that this began in Galilee after the baptism of John. You recall that Jesus himself was baptized of John. Now he, unlike all of the others, had no sins to remit, but he was submitting to the righteous command of God. And he identified his ministry and mission with that of John's when he was immersed by John in the Jordan River. And the record in Matthew chapter 3 tells us so beautifully 
that when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now for the first 30 years of his life, Jesus lived an ordinary but sinless life. He grew, grew from a child to manhood. He worked as a carpenter. He lived and worked among the people. And to them he was simply one of them. But when he was immersed by John and came forth from the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit in great symbolism came down upon him and like the oil that anointed prophets, priests, and kings for all of those ages before him, the Holy Spirit was now anointing him as our prophet, our priest, and our king. Our prophet, meaning that as the Christ, we're to listen and we're to obey Him. As our priest, we're to look to Him in obedient faith for the forgiveness of our sins. And as our king, we are to submit to Him as the ruler of our hearts and our lives. You see, that's what we mean when we call Him Jesus Christ. He is the chosen and anointed one of God, sent to the earth to teach us. He died to redeem us. He was resurrected to free us. He went back to heaven to intercede for us. And He sits at the right hand of God to rule over us. Have you acknowledged Him as the Christ? Have you come to believe in Him as the Son of God and the Christ that God sent to this earth and anointed to be prophet, priest, and king? Have you submitted to His lordship and His rulership? Have you been baptized according to His instruction for the remission of your sins and thus been saved and entered into His kingdom? Lord willing, in our future studies, we'll talk about preaching Jesus as Lord and preaching Jesus as King. So you'll want to be sure to join us for those studies coming up. I have some announcements, but first, we'll have another song.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. I hope your faith in Jesus has been strengthened, that He is not only the Son of God, He correspondingly is the Christ, the Anointed One. And I hope that you'll recognize Him as such in your life today by obedience to the Gospel. Let Him be your Messiah, to lead you out of sin, to represent you before God, to rule over your heart, to guide you and lead you in the ways of the Lord. He is the Son of God. He's the only way to heaven. And I hope you'll receive Him in gospel obedience today by being baptized for the remission of your sins and become His disciple. The Lord willing, the next time we're together, we'll continue our series and we'll talk about preaching Jesus as Lord. That title is very closely connected to the title of Christ, but there are some things we need to learn about His Lordship in particular, and we'll take that up in our next study together. If you'd like a free printed copy of our lesson today, get in touch with us and ask for the particular lesson, Preaching Jesus as the Christ, and we'll send it to you. If you'd like to go back and watch our lessons in this series so far, you can find them on YouTube, also our website, ltbstv.org. You can also follow us on social media and be updated about the program from week to week. We have a podcast you can subscribe to, plenty of ways to reach out and connect with us, and we hope you'll do just that. Make your plans if the Lord wills to join me back here next time for another Bible study. I look forward to that time together. Until then, I pray you have a great, safe week ahead. May God richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.